There's a little garage on a small town street. I like to meet my friends there every week, and I know we'll talk about some facts and things. History and science and some crazy shit. Talking it out with Alan, Ben, and Nick, and I know that it's gonna be a weird ass show. Ooh, insanity abounds. Ooh, the world is spinning round. Now we're gonna break it down. This is Informed and Confused. Today we are finishing up our discussion about the Kaiser. Alan? The Kaiser spends 20 years basically scaring and intimidating Europe into being friendly with Germany to uh, ending up with the two uh, alliance systems where Britain, you got Britain, France, and Russia on the one side, and then Austria and Germany on the other. Um, which leads us up to uh, July 1914, um, the July crisis. Uh, the July crisis. Which starts World War One. Yeah, their 4th um, of July picnic ran out of hot dogs. It was a nightmare. Um, Wasn't World War One the whole Luft balloon thing, the college kids? No, 99 Luft balloons is about nuclear proliferation. Something related the, to 99 World War Luft balloons okay. about nukes. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Right, so we, we get to that science. point. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated in. Uh, no, 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 that's not a weird aside. That just shows how little we as Americans understand about foreign cultures. We're talking about Germans, right? What about that balloon song that everyone loves? <laughs> To be fair, but, public school didn't really cover any knowledge heavily that didn't have the Americans oh, involved. Dude, mine, mine did seven years straight of history classes covering World War motherfucking two. Yeah. Like, no matter where we started, the bulk of the unit would be World War, War two, motherfucking yeah. two. I had oh, yeah. a semester, and our teacher started with... Pearl Harbor, like, and went from there onward. Like I, I he had only covered the parts of the war that we were personally involved in. Like I had really yeah. good history teachers, which is why I understand what happened in Europe during that time frame. But that's just it. I understand what happened in Europe. As far as the Pacific goes, show me random footage from a war movie of a beach getting the hell blown out of it, and I'm like, yeah, that's what it was like. I don't fucking know. I know there were tunnels. Yeah. Uh, I know there was one cat that was found in, like, what was it, 1978, who was like, no, the war's still on. Dude, no, it's not. The war's still on! Well, because, yeah, so many of those bases in the Pacific were isolated, and they didn't hear that the war had ended until, like, a decade or two later. <coughs> and, yeah, the Pacific was a crazy time and area. Right. So, anyways... Anyway, anyways um, Finally, get up to World War One, and oddly enough, um, you, you would think with a man who was—you were talking about the July close, crisis, yeah, the July crisis, which is what they call the start of the, of the war, which, which I'm um, not familiar with. So, give me a rundown. Um, What's the July so crisis? In, back in June, Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austrian throne, gets assassinated by Serbian nationals. Right. Uh, no the lie. Serbians take him. Wasn't going to. I have to be careful with that one. Now that you're you. telling me. All right. So the Serbian, basically, the it, for reasons we won't go into, it takes the Serbian, the Austrians, a month, full month, to de- send an ultimatum to and declare war on Serbia. I'm sure there uh, which was is lots why it's of the July crisis. Going on. Um. Okay. So the declaration of Serbia Austria, was the July crisis. Austria declares war on Serbia. Because of the assassination from a month ago, and everybody gotcha. starts freak, freaking out. Um, yeah, the, the, well, the weren't those war, both it's, fairly it's a chain small? Of well, yeah. Um, part of the question is why weren't uh, those two fairly small nations without a, a huge oh, no, amount no, no. of power? Uh, Austria, Austria, Hungary is a rather large country, but same size as Germany. Uh, you can go the size as France. It, it controlled Austria, Hungary at this time controls all of what is now Austria, Hungary. Slovenia, Croatia, Bosnia, 
Uh, okay. The Czech Republic, Slovak- Slo- I was assuming Slovakia, most of those were part of part the Part of Russian southern Poland, part of what is now Ukraine. Stuff. Okay. Uh, and all of Transylvania, which is about half of Roma- what is now Romania. Oh, Bi- and plus and a little other pieces. Mi- spooky. Yeah, in Big my country. mind, Big country. I was thinking most of those were part of the Russian um, Empire stuff. Okay, no, that definitely changes the yeah. lines I, mean, I had mentally drawn. Well, one of the things, too, like, always keep those lines flexible, because depending on where you go in history, it yeah. changes. years can be... Yeah. It's, no, no, no. Yeah. New, new king, that whole region, that whole region, the borders yeah. have been shifting for the past. The entire time we've been ta- time period we've been talking about borders have been okay. shifting. Okay, uh, that, that's yeah, part of why the war when starts here. I was here. trying to get an idea of where the various nations were sitting because I'll admit that area of the world I know very little about the yeah. borders shifting and who controlled what, where, yeah. when. B- I know at one point Russia uh, controlled a huge portion of uh, Europe. Well, but, well, that's after, after World War II when it had puppet back. states um, with the Warsaw Pact and all that. Okay. But basically in, the, in this time period, the way to look at it is all this territory in the Balkan Peninsula used to be controlled by the Turks. As the Turks start losing control of it, the Austrians and the Russians basically start fighting over the leftovers. Okay, gotcha. And there's a lot of ethnic and nationalistic um, rivalries that get involved, and it's, a, it's, a, it's just a giant mess worthy okay. of its own discussion. Um which leads to might the, be worth uh, going back yeah. to and touching in more detail, but we're not yeah. going to. Here. But bottom, bottom line, Austrian and Serbia don't like each other. A Serbian kills the Austrian, so they heir to the throne. War. They decide this is the right time to okay. teach the Serbians a lesson. They, and they declare given the war. time frame, they are reasonably decent, militantly armed yeah. nations of uh, power. Austria so. is one of the great powers. One of the five great powers. It's oh, the, one okay. of the one they were that. Yeah, it's, it's at this there. point it's probably the second weakest of them uh, out of out of the bunch. The uh, the number weakest four would, or five. <laughs> number four, yeah, the weakest would be Italy, which was basically uh, only in the club really? for Italy Ital- was in the club. Italy was in the club more as a matter of I mean, like I'd an think honorific of thing Navy, than anything else. But even Italy's then, Italy's been quiet in like current history. They used to do a lot more shit. Yeah. Well, the, back when. There was their a lot army, more their army, out of Rome. they had a lot of internal political issues at this point. And their army was generally crap, which is saying so. You know, the, the Austrian army was pretty. The whole, all the armies in that world were kind of like the Russian army. The quality of the Russian army, the Austrian army, and the Italian army were all crap. It was just a matter of different levels of crap. So one was able to beat the uh, the others. The Austrians pretty much had the upper hand on the Italians, and the Russians had the upper hand on the on the Austrians. But everybody else beat the crap out of all of them, uh, right. quality-wise. For again, number whole laundry list of reasons. But anyways, we the, get to my this problem point. Is we start talking about Italy, and I just think back to Assassin's Creed Two, which I know is not a good basis of information for the past. Actually, that was praised on its historic accuracy. I know they did well, a lot that's of a, that's research. It's a totally and stuff, different era, I imagine. It, it's a different era. Medieval? It is before Renaissance. that. Yeah, Renaissance. It's Renaissance yeah. but. It really Very gets different Da Vinci place. builds you a tank and a flying oh my machine. God. Cool. Uh, but um, even Not really. through the that, my knowledge of Italy is cities. that <laughs> although it's a country, it's a whole lot of city states that, with different people in charge who are constantly fighting each other. Yeah. So Italy seems, in my brain at least, and I have a whole lot less actual historical knowledge, but Italy seems like one of those countries that's always fighting itself. Well, that's even true at this point a little bit. They, they, Italy unified a little bit before, just before Germany did in the 1860s. Um, but it still suffers from a lot of those internal divisions, especially the north versus south thing. Uh, the north-south thing is, was a thing for a that's still long, a thing. long, long The north-south yeah, thing is still, still a thing. A thing. Um, the thing. Because the north is more industrialized, more developed, and, and the, the south, south is more, r- more and agriculture and poor. Because um, that's where so the you got that whole grows. thing going on. Um, anyways, but as far as the Kaiser is concerned with this whole thing, yeah. you would think a man whose bellicose activity led to this whole setup so much would be a little more of a driving force in starting it. And after the war, he caught a lot of blame as Germany as a whole did for causing the war. Germany caused the war. Looking at it back with hindsight and distance, well, it was that's, not the, that's not so much the case. He was Sorry. actually one of the 
most people, most people involved in this process actually didn't want a war to break out. That's one of the common misconceptions. There were a well, few people. Well, I don't think anybody were, really wants a war. Well, there were to break a few. There, uh, were, there are always people who want to show their uh, war dicks, but there were a I don't few people who were advocating really for it, especially in Austria. Mo- mostly in Austria, but most of the others wanted to avoid a war if they could. Once. It, once it kind of became inevitable, well, they I'm started pretty rationalizing sure they all it. knew that if any war broke out, it would become a much larger issue because of well, all yeah. the because of the closeness of all the countries involved in Europe. Yeah. Europe is Europe was such a powder keg yeah. for so much of its history just but, because all these small individual countries right next to each other, if something happens between two countries, everyone touching those countries is gonna yeah. be affected by it. But uh, as, far, like, as far as the Kaiser is concerned here, he, when, when, when the Archduke is assassinated back in June, he's on his yacht. And he comes back, even though they tell him not to, mostly because he and the Archduke were really good friends. He comes back, um, the Austrians aren't ready to do anything, so basically the Austrians ask, ask uh, the Kaiser, you know, do we have your support if we're going to do something about this? And he says, yep, you have, you have my full, total, un- un- oh, unadulterated yeah, sure, support. Oh, yeah, sure, you're my friends, I'll help you. What, what, what becomes known historically is the blank check. Uh, yeah. Although, it, it's worth noting, the Austrians don't actually tell him what they're going to I, do, I largely because they movie. haven't figured it out yet. They just do the, hey, um, probably going to need your help. Are you in? You got our backs? This goes you to got shit. our backs? You got our backs? You in? Yeah. All right. Go ahead. Right. Teach those Serbs a lesson. Awesome. No, nothing is said about what anybody's <laughs> going to actually do, just that something needs to be done, and the Germans have the Austrians' backs. So um, it was left to the Germans to determine a final solution, is what you're saying? It was left Ooh. to the Austrians to determine that. The Germans were leaving it to the Austrians. Ah. That was bad. Must yeah, not yeah, God that was really must bad. Not God and that's okay. coming from me. <laughs> Anyways, uh, he goes back on his yacht, um, goes sailing again. Uh, like I said, for the month, everything comes down while the Austrians are figuring their shit out. Uh, then the Austrians send the ultimatum, they declare war on Serbia, everybody in Europe starts paying attention now, because people are actually about to start well, shooting sure each other. Well, I'm sure it took about a month for them to actually, uh, get their army, uh, established and there, ready. There were, there were, there were military, logistical, yeah. and diplomatic the, reasons why they waited. There were things they had to prepare but, before they gave the actual declaration. Yeah. That um, makes sense. Un- unfortunately, it meant that all the sympathy they built up over, oh my God, this guy, you know, assassinated the heir to their throne, cursed them, you know, idiot Serbs for doing this. All that, all that goodwill, all that, you know, kind of wore off and everybody was over it. So a month later when they declared war, it's just like, it looked more just like the Austrians just randomly taking a shot at the Serbs, uh, which didn't help things. It took them but, too long to get yeah, their they, shit. They had, they had reasons why they waited that long, but it came, it came with that baggage, but... That downside to it. Um, anyways, so the, basically for the entire rest of the crisis, the Kaiser spends most of his time trying to, to the best he can, and it's, it's hard for him because he's not getting all the information, largely because the Austrians aren't telling the Germans stuff, the Russians aren't telling anybody stuff, and his own officials are either li- not, not li- so much lying to him, but keeping him out of the loop because they're afraid he's going to do what he always does, and that's get in getting in the way and and do something stupid. Unfortunately, in this case, it's you're cutting out of the loop the guy who ultimately has to make the final decision and who actually doesn't want a war. Um, So, or although most of them didn't at this point, but the point is he's out of the loop. By the time he's actually back in the loop, his options are very, very limited. Um, You know, like when, when the Serbians respond to the ultimatum the Austrians send to him, uh, and it comes back, and the Austrians agree to pretty much everything the, Ser- the, uh, the Serbians agree to pretty much everything the Austrians want. Um, even though the Austrians n- never intend to actually, like, you know. Uh, the declaration was official. They were never. F- they, they were going to declare war either way. The, the, the ultimatum was designed for them to be, re- for it to be rejected so yeah. that they'd have a reason. The, the Kaiser looks at the result from the ultimatum and is like, holy crap, this is a great diplomatic victory. We don't need to. Austria doesn't need to go with Serbia now. They. The Serbians it, have capitulated. Agreed. It's They're a humiliation. Give you all of this they don't shit. need to go to war. Well, the Austrians were 
nobody had told them that the Austrians never intended for this to be an actual diplomatic thing. It was just an excuse. So when the Austrians declared war yeah. anyways, um, it looked all of a sudden, it was like, well, well, what the hell are you doing now? And the Austrians are like, well, you were early egging us on to do something. And it's like, well, yeah, but that was back a month ago. Now you've waited too long. Now this is just causing us a problem. So, so what you're saying is a light turned on. Everyone looked around and went, what just happened? And then a stern older man said, Aww. war were declared. War were declared. Mm. In a sense, um, although the old man getting saying war were declared was drowned out by the everybody else just panicking their heads off, <laughs> trying to deal with the situation. The important thing is, did did they get their ham flavored gum? <laughs> obscure man. That is very it obscure. It's all gristling bones. But okay. Anyway, so anyways, so the, the two of them uh, declare well the one Austria, so Austria is at war with Serbia. The Austria Germans are not particularly war. happy about Serbia it. Serbia has to respond, then Germany threw in with the Austrians, so they're... Well, hold, hold on, hold on, I'll pull, put the brakes on. Um, basically, so you've got this whole, this is the crisis. The Austrians and the Serbians have declared war. The Russians are not happy about this. The, the, they're really because close. Because they're close <laughs> with the Serbians, and they cannot afford for complex diplomatic reasons to let the Serbians just get their ass kicked. Um, so now it looks like Austria and Russia are going to go to war, and the Germans, like, well, if that happens, then we got to support the Austrians, and this thing's just going to blow up. So everybody starts, in all the capitals of Europe, starts looking for ways out of this thing. One of the most prosperous, uh, not prosperous, uh, potentially be- uh, workable solutions that it gets to come up with uh, actually is something that Kaiser picks up on. I think it was an idea floated to him by one of his aides or whatever, and he picks up on it and puts it out there. Oddly enough, um, the, I want to say the British Foreign Secretary, Secretary uh, Gray, comes up with the idea on his own uh, at almost the same time. It's called the Stop in Belgrade Plan. Basically, the Aust- for the Austrian army to move into Serbia, occupy the capital, and just stop, and then let everybody negotiate. Um, Sorry, what was the name of the plan? Stop in, stop in Belgrade. In it, Belgrade. Which okay. is the Serbian capital. Basically, the Austrian army would move into Serbia, Occupy the capital, which is, like, just on the border for weird reasons. Until everybody um, calms the Yeah, and, then, and then use that as a position for negotiations. We're occupying your capital. Now we're going to negotiate, and once you've, we've signed an agreement, we will pull back. Leave. The, German, yeah. the Prussians did something similar with the French at the end of the Franco-Prussian War. So the idea had precedence. Uh, and he advocates this, and this kind of becomes the German position and the, but the Austrians reject it because at this point the Austrians are just committed to uh, they want to kill the crap, everybody, beating the crap out of the Serbs. Um, I want to murdelate them. That was the, the one major, uh, one of the major things he uh, put forward in this whole thing. The other one was what's known as the Nikki, the Nikki Willie letters. I know I've told you about this before. Um, yeah, where uh, it was him. I and think we his touched on him briefly cousin, during the it? World War cousin One. The ki- episode. Cousin yeah. the Czar. Yeah, no, Sorry, and they, yeah. they used their childhood nicknames. They were so familiar yeah. and affectionate with one another. And wrote in English because they were both fluent. Yep. Yep. It, we um, touched on them during the World War One episode. Yeah, we were talking about World War I. may or may not be before or after this. I don't yeah. know where our... The, it um, will absolutely be before this. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, anyways, um, they write back and forth and try to, you know, a lot of goodwill... I mean, sincere efforts on both their parts to calm things down. Um, oh, yeah, no, it's one of those things. And the more it basically you look gets at the overshadowed by actually in power during all of these events. No one wanted shit to go where it did. Oh yeah, no one. No, no one, one or like I said, one or two. Which Mostly is kind the, of impressive that it managed to go as far as it did with yeah. well, everybody that's, not that's just wanting it. The, it. The way, like, everybody had their treaties set up, it was basically as soon as anyone took any definitive action. Everybody, Everybody else, else had to side into yeah. a course. Yeah, ba- basically, if you had a p- if you, if we got a pin pin blame on names, um, the Austrian foreign minister and the Austrian uh, yeah the Austrians in chief, who decided to those two play individuals this game and they were the ones actively yeah, actively on a personal level. Uh, uh, Berktold was the foreign minister, and Conrad was the name of the. Uh, uh, 
war minister or the ar army commander in chief. Because um, they were the, the ones who put forth the, the weakness treaty of and ally full systems versus non aggression of. agreements. Yeah. Um, well, and that it was, is it was mostly a, and we've I mean, learned And since even in their case, even in their case, they had legitimate reasons. The Austria leg was legitimately afraid of thing of, of Serbia simply because they knew their own empire was due to its ethnic makeup was starting to fall apart. The different ethnicities were want start, were agitating for autonomy or independence, and the Serbs were sticking their nose in there trying to agitate the hell out of it. So they saw Serbia as an existential threat to the existence of their very nation. And the Serbians had gotten away with some shit in the decades prior to that. And every time the Austrians had even remotely, you know, had tried to be diplomatic about it or whatever, they kept getting, you know, defeated diplomatically. And the Serbians just kept getting physically bigger and more powerful and more influential. And that's why these guys eventually said this was the line in the sand. We have to stop this now or this is going to be fatal for us. You know, it doesn't fully excuse it, but it explains it. They had, they weren't just, you know, yeah, war, let's, you yeah, know, let's no, kick some ass. First, there was they no, had there reasons. There was no one in this just looking for wanton destruction. Yeah, yeah they that, had that that was not legitimate reasons between. why they thought this was the proper course of action for the best interests of their own country. That was the biggest difference between the two world wars is the first world war, you can't point at someone and say they were the bad guy. Yeah. It, it's yeah. really difficult to come up with. <laughs> Anyone in the First World War who didn't have a legitimate and reasonable yeah, I mean, response no, looking to at it both happened. World Wars were caused by a series of bastards. Well, well the yes. second one, much more so, one particular bastard motivated by revenge, but there were multiple yes. players in this. Yeah. Anyways, we should probably bring yeah. this back to Wilhelm. What was he doing right. for this so, first? Yeah, the, the Nikki Willie letters, which... Um, the biggest problem with the Nikki Will letters were, first of all, everybody's starting to get a little paranoid. So, like, when the, when the Zara writes to him that, you know, the mobilization we're undertaking is we didn't just do this in response to what's going on right now. We've, we've been doing this for a while since, like, the, the 5th or wh whatever the heck the date was, um, you know, as a defensive measure in response to what the Austrians did. Well, the Kaiser looks at this and is like, holy crap, that means the, the Russians have been mobilizing for, like, Five days before, more than us. We've got to mobilize now, or we're gonna we're gonna lag behind. So you get stuff like that, and the, there was also the fact that the Russian um, the Russians were basically lying to the Germans. Um, they they were they were saying publicly that they were mo mobilizing their armies facing Austri the Austrian border, and that was it. While secretly they were taking steps to prepare mobilization of their armies facing the German border. Well, based on and what? the Germans find out about this. Which meant, and then when they confronted the Russians, the Russians kept lying. So at that point, you know, nobody this trusted to be a anybody. a pattern in yeah. Russian history. Oh God. Yeah, it's, and the, the, yeah, the, it's a, the whole story of this whole start of this war is people, either either diplomats and officials saying shit on their own initiative without telling their government or ignoring what their government tells them, and governments lying and hiding shit and being secretive which causes mistrust on the other end, so that when they legitimately offer a plan to, you know, like, See, this no, is, we don't this mean this. This is why this. we can't have big government now. These little small-time shits ruined it for everyone. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, big um, brother loves you. Yeah. The, the, uh, once the Nikki, Nikki Willie uh, letters fail, and the Russians do fully mobilize, which means the Germans have to mobilize, and neither side's going to back down because nobody, you can't afford to let the other side mobilize when you don't, because that means they'll just steamroll you while your army's not ready. That means the German, eventually they have to, the Germany declares war on, is going to declare war on Russia. Um, because that's Because just, of tensions at the border. Because, yeah, because neither side's going to, neither, neither side's going to blink. Um, what happens then is, due to the German war plan, uh, again, for reasons we won't get into this, World War epi one episode, um, in order, in order to mobilize its army and go to war with Russia, it also has to go to war with France and actually attack because France Because of France Russia first. and France's alliance that yeah, we talked about the, earlier. The war, basically, they, they, they have to beat the French it's before they can fight the Russians. It's a series of interlaced dominoes. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, so 
Um, at one point, while while this is going on, I think they'd already they're about to declare war on Russia. Or they, I, I think, and they're, they've been feeling out the British this whole time as to whether or not the British are going to come in on the side of the French and the Russians or not. Which I because believe, if, given the way the dominoes are falling, is probably. Yeah, they, they eventually do. I mean, uh, yes, I know they eventually do, but even at that point, I'm pretty sure it was yeah. pretty clear that they were well, coming in Well, it was actually some France doubt. There was actually, there was actually a legitimate doubt. Really? Ultimately, the German invasion of Belgium thing, Belgium thing is what tipped the balance. But um, largely because of that, the, the British cabinet, through most of this whole thing, is divided, so they can't have an official position, so they're just kind of sitting off on the side set telling everybody to calm down but not actually taking a position on anything, which the Germans are trying to get them to be forceful about it, uh, either to be forcefully neutral, so are the French and the Russians, to be forcefully on their side because they think if we can do this, we can get we the Austrians to back We don't care what you do, but make a decision and make it now so the rest of us can. can. Yeah, because yeah. If, you, if, you, if you make it clear that you are going to be in on our side, yeah. the other side will back down. Yeah, one way or the other, they, but they can't do it. waffling, make a decision, yeah. Germany. Or Britain. Or, oh, the British. sorry. Because sorry. the British cabinet is they, divided. We're talking if about they, Britain, uh, sorry. If, if make they, a decision, Britain. Yeah, if they would have tried to make a decision one way or the other, the government would have fell, just given the balance of the Power how things... Power in Britain at the time. Yeah. Um, so... At the last hour, there's a message that comes through from the German ambassador in London. Um, uh, Lipnowski, I think is the guy's name. Um, Anglophile. He'd always been an a- advocate of a German-British alliance. He'd never wanted to... Uh, Make sense for the, the person br- you sent the British, to the British embassy. He never wanted the animosity between the British and the Germans. Um, or to the German he embassy sends, He sends a message out of a garbled conversation he and uh, Foreign Minister Gray in Britain have where they basically, I think, I think the explanation was like they got confused over what they were, what proposals they were specifically talking about at the time. And basically he came away with the impression that Gray was say, saying, um, we want to know if we, pr- if, if um, we promise to remain neutral in a war between you and Russia, if it's just you and Russia, will you not attack France? Can we have a situation here where you just go to war with Russia and then we in France stay neutral? Which, which to the German must have sounded like which a is great, great. Deal. That, that avoids their yeah, no, that, war and that avoids that entire the Kaiser, half of their the Kaiser goes to uh, Moltke um, their border. Yeah, the Kaiser goes to Moltke, who is Moltke the younger, as opposed to Moltke the el- elder. I think I mentioned er- earlier. Um, it was his nephew, the other other guy's nephew. Uh, who's the commander in chief of the German armies? And he says, "Let's just march the whole army to the east. Why bother attack? We're not going to attack the French. We'll just march but the army to the east and fight the Russians." Britain said they're going to stay neutral. We don't have to worry right. about France. Why, We're just going to go after the Russians. Why does this seem like it's going to backfire? Well, because Mul- Mulkey immediately tells him, oh, "We can't." Because we know a little bit about history. Yeah, <laughs> Mul- Mulkey Im- immediately tells him that um, we can't Germans do that. Don't know. Given the given the level of detail of the war plans. Like down to where each train car is on the tracks by the hour. Right. The this plan has been they've been building up this plan for years. This is one plan. Inc- well, I want to say this is the era that we get the whole. Mi- Wait, no, that was Italy, not Germany, that made the trains run on time. Yeah, that, that, that's that, a Mussolini that made, thing. That's, that's Mussolini. Yeah. Never mind. But no, never mind. Bit of a misnomer. The trains actually didn't run any more frequently. Yeah. But um, no, but you're right about trains. Trains are a big thing here. Because with uh, trains are a big part of this. Because with 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 modern trains and modern mechanization, you can move the armies a lot quicker. Oh and yeah, a lot, and a lot more. well, you can go quicker than you can in uh, any sort of other land vehicle at this yeah. time in Prior history. Prior, you know, there was a point in time where rail maps were the single most tactically valuable thing you could yeah. have. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were literally like the, the so much of the German I mean, war plan was train schedules. That's that's, that's well, true all the way into World uh, War Two. Like that yeah. doesn't change until you start seeing the rise of you know. Correct Giant me if I'm wrong, but World War I Unimog. was before the combustion engine? No. Nope. No, no, that was after combustion Cars engine. were a thing. So we had yeah, They cars, were still we new, but Jeeps, they were a but, thing. Uh, but because they were so new, they didn't hit the kind of speeds you could get on a train. Uh, train technology at the time would have been looking right? at, like, 
like if you're talking like, like rural 40, lines, 50 mm, miles like an rural hour. lines where maintenance isn't uh, quite as regular and it's not necessarily the straightest or most level terrain. Oh, see, I think that would be your straight lines is straight uh, through the country. You still have to deal with the terrain. Okay. Um, you're probably looking at about 70, 80 at that at that point in time, technology mm. wise. Oh, geez, that's a whole lot faster than I thought. I if was thinking forty or fifty. If you 50. could, if you no. could get level straight line, yeah. you could easily get yeah. it to a hundred. Cars could okay. Cars could get up to that speed at this point. Hopping similar, rails at that point, but not not right. not easily. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by far, the train was the most efficient method yeah. to get we, a lot of troops somewhere. We had fi- yeah. steam engines had been figured out. Well, uh, uh, they were a known technology. Lo- locomotives, no matter where you were on the planet, had a fairly uniform design because we had just figured out what worked, how yeah. you want to distribute the weight. We learned of this from system. each other and they figured were, out the most optimal way of doing it. They were that, that they were heavily way. using trains to move troops around in the Civil War, in yeah. the eighteen sixties. Yeah, yeah, I remember um, that. Yeah, but although at this point there's, there's far more uh, lines of rail. In both America oh, and Europe, Europe, so they're oh, just yeah. all that much more effective. But anyways, so yeah, Moltke tells them, tells the Kaiser, we can't do it. It'll it'll cause chaos if we try to interrupt the plan. Um, in hindsight, uh, after the war, they talked to certain people, and they almost certainly could have done it, but. Just uh, they were uh, so was, scared of. Was that the guy who took over for? Um, it was the our head of the army. Oh, okay. Head of the army, uh, the guy who took over the, the guy for who Bismarck. Had, um, the guy who took over for Bismarck is there were the several central the chancellor. Position, the yeah, chancellor, um, thank that, you. that guy, uh, the central guy central governmental position. Yeah. At this time, uh, that guy is uh, von Bet- Bettman Holwig is his name. Um, there were like two or three. I think it was like two or three. There were like two guys after Bismarck, real briefly, and then von Bolo, Bello, von Bolo. I think, yeah. Uh, for a few years, and then Bettman Holig was pretty much chancellor all the way through uh, 1917, right okay. before the end of the war. Um, but uh, he and the Kaiser actually got on fairly comparatively well. Well, I'm he, sure he was handpicked by the Kaiser. Uh, during the war, he and the Kaiser would uh, end up agreeing on a lot of stuff, in opposi- largely in opposition to the generals. But I'll get to that. Well, I'm sure he was um, handpicked by the Kaiser to be his right yeah, man. Yeah. Um, although, I mean, they had their issues. The Kaiser had issues with bloody everybody. But um, what I understand, that was just kind of him. just his personality. Yeah, personality um, wise. Anyways, um, as it turns out, that the whole gray thing turns out to be a mi- complete misunderstanding. It wasn't a thing, anyways. Um, it it but was misconstruing what the British Prime Minister it's, said. It is one of the first moments where the Kaiser, because ultimately he, he agrees with Moltke. Uh, they kind of compromise and say, all right, you can at least slow this down a little bit to let us, you know, investigate this thing a little more. But he goes along with Moltke. It's kind of the first point where he starts to, um, where, the, where, the, where the generals start to start making most of the decisions, a process which will become more and more prevalent as the war goes on. Um, he loses he's, he, he also starts having a couple of, um, I think it's around this time when he starts having a couple ma- like um, fits, Around this time, he, already the the stress on his mind from like psychosis, just, just the the deal, like hysterics breakdowns. or depression, going into bouts of depression, like before uh, when he starts, of he can't sorts. handle the, okay. the stress of the situation and make, dealing with this. That makes um, sense because he's under a fair the, amount the little of stress signs at of that it, point that he's not gonna he's not gonna at handle this war well. Um, start. Um, eventually, he's convinced that they have to. By Moltke and the generals that, you know, the Russians have a head start on us. We have to mobilize. And for us, mobilization means we have to go to war for various logistical reasons. So eventually he's convinced that we have to do this and eventually gives in and signs the declaration of war. Um, and that's the, really the extent of his direct involvement over most issues for the rest of the process. Um, like I said before... At that point, the, the generals start making most of the decisions, and both he and Bettman Hollug will increasingly, increasingly be more and more sidelined to the point that by 19... Uh, I tell you, certainly by... Ni- I think by 1917, when Bettman Hollug is forced to resign, uh, him, 
Eric von Eric Ludendorff, who's the quartermaster general of the German army, um, is functionally military dictator of Germany at that point, for all intents and purposes. Um, he doesn't have the title or anything, but in all practical, the actual head he of the army is... He basically took control from... Yeah, the, the civilian the leadership are just completely um, paralyzed and inept. Yeah, and he was the strong man that the people rallied behind. Yeah, basically. well, the, the, the actual... I mean, the Kaiser at this point is completely marginalized. And everybody's pretty much lost uh, any faith in him whatsoever. Um, the big hero, the person everybody rallies behind is Hindenburg. Who is seen as the as the hero of the Zeppelins. Battle of Tannenberg? Yeah, the guy who the Hindenburg Zeppelin is named after. Um, he's the actual commander. He's Ludendorff's boss. Ludendorff started out as his chief of staff, but Ludendorff is the brains. And more and more as the war goes on, Hindenburg just pays less and less attention to the actual running of the war and just because he, he was already retired when the war started. They brought him out of retirement. He's already a fairly old dude. So that by the time they actually make it to the top of the, the running the German army, it's Ludendorff. And Hindenburg just kind of comes in every day to check up on things and see what's going on. He's there for the name. Everybody rallies to Hindenburg. He's the, the great savior of the nation, right? So as this happens, what happens to our Kaiser? Um, he becomes increasingly, like, like I said, basically most of the war he spends doing things like handing out medals and shit, so just being the public hero. face. Um, like I said, he, he starts mentally breaking down a lot uh, as years go by where, and because of this... Does he become unstable? He has moments of instability. He's never like just totally out of it. He's not like King George III or anything it's like, like that. It's like anybody past okay. 80. You have an off day. Pretty okay, much. but it's not like he's on a daily basis throwing shit around his office. No, nothing like that. He's not More like he, he changes his down. mind. He changes his mind pathologically just all the time, you know, one minute thinking they should be doing one thing and another minute they should be doing another. Um, he's never really Paranoia. effectively in control. Um, basically, almost from the start, at, at the end of 1914, when the shooting plan fails, Mulkey gets dismissed and a guy named Falkenhayn becomes commander of the army. And he and Ludendorff do not like each other at all. Falkenhayn wants to focus on fighting the French. Ludendorff wants to fight, focus fighting on the Russians. And they can't come to an agreement. Technically, Falkenhayn it's is... It's easy. Give each of them half the army to do with what they want. Well, <laughs> the thing is, Falkenhayn is technically Ludendorff and Hindenburg's boss. But given right. the stature that they get at the start of the war as victors of the Battle of Tannenberg, which was like the most decisive battle of the entire war right at the outset, they just smashed an entire Russian army while being more than, outnumbered more than two to, the, two to one. It ah. was just... Yeah. But and that makes him makes him like national heroes and basically after that they were responsible for most of Germany's wins at that point, which come against the Russians. So they Falkenhayn is technically his boss, and obviously the Kaiser is all their bosses, but for political reasons they can't ever fire Hindenburg or Ludendorff. And it eventually gets to the point where every time they want something they just threaten to resign and politically they have to just give it to him. Um, because they're just the political They're consequences would be too... Yeah, the political yeah. consequences of how the public would react is just too unbearable. Um, so basically, you get this thing where it's basically a civil war in the German sta general uh, staff a between... A three-way tug of war. Well, two-way, between Falkenhayn well, true, you and said the, Ludendorff. You said the Hindenburg and Ludendorff is basically like one at entity point. at this point. They actually abbreviate... Like, people would write the abbreviation for them as an H with an L coming off the side of the H. Because they were that ubiquitously considered one thing, like a celebrity couple. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's basically Ludendorff doing doing everything while Hindenburg just stands there looking, uh, you know, all heroic, important, uh, and important. Yeah, um, and the Kaiser, the Kaiser basically has to try and balance this out, and rather than ever, ever making a decision, he basically just keeps coming up with half-assed compromises. He keeps waffling between. Which yeah, which basically just keeps this thing going on, so that the German, the whole. Through most of the war, the German military command is at war with itself because yeah, the two sides are... That realistically, that's yeah. probably better for history. If they yeah. had been united in their cause... 
I mean, they managed to do pretty damn well aside that. Okay. Although that could be said if we want, if we want, if we want to start like, like talking alternate history, if. there's a real chance that if Germany had won, Hitler never would have risen to power, and we would have grown up under a German utopia as their ideology spread. Well, the uh, the Hitler thing almost certainly German utopia, nah, but you could certainly make an argument though that the world would have ended off more pe- generally more peaceful and better off if the Germans had won World War One, depending on how they won and when they won. But there are scenarios you can come up plausibly alternate come up history with. History is alternate. Oh, yeah. We're where, talking yeah. about what well, that, actually that, happened. It's one of those things. Like no matter how awful a war is, once bullets stop flying, once bombs stop falling. People just want shit to go back to normal yeah. and be nice. I mean, cause, cause and the that, big, that's uniform I think that's to every really, culture, yeah. every country. People just want shit to be nice. They that's just it. want yeah. tomorrow to be like today, <clears throat> which is hopefully like yesterday. Yeah. I mean, um, what was I going to say? Uh, uh, we were talking about his end of life or during the war. During the war. Yeah, uh, uh, so yeah, the, yeah, that whole thing going on, and that in, indecisiveness, and basically his inability to deal with, because Falkenhayn is basically just trying to do his job for the most part. Ludendorff and Hindenburg are just being outright insubordinate about shit, um, and he keeps having to, you know, give them what they want or whatever. And because he can't do that, eventually by 1917, when the the kind of the final straw is the issue of the submarine unrestricted submarine warfare thing comes up again. Ah, the <coughs> Undersee The Undersee I know you love that word. Undersee Um I love that. The Germans had stopped it briefly after the Lusitania and that, and the, the, the Americans had gotten all pissy about it. Now in 1917, they want to start it up again, just out of desperation. And again, pretty much all the military guys want to do this. Um, except the only ones who are against it are Bettman Holwig, the Chancellor, and the Kaiser. And ultimately, the military guys ah. get their way. <clears throat> and uh, Bettman Holwig is forced to resign. Uh, and at that, from that point on, when the Kaiser basically can't, re- uh, can't resist you know, what the military guys want in even the naming of his own government, Ludendorff essentially runs the German government at that point. And the Kaiser, he's still there at meetings and all that. He's but mostly a figurehead. You know. Forgive me, yeah, this, he's is, a figurehead. this is a terrible aside, but how weird is it to think back to <laughs> World War I, something that you think about almost in the terms of ancient history due to how detached we are from it? Well, we're talking about Submarine roughly 100 years warfare, ago. man. We're talking about roughly yeah. 100 years ago. I, no, I realize it's, it's, it's <clears throat> one of those things. Actually, like, a little more than 100 years by now because it's 2019. Last so. November was the end of the week. 100th anniversary of the end of the war. Yeah, so we're talking more than a hundred years ago. Yeah, time goes by, man. Yeah, no, Tempest th- fugit. This this time, a uh, hundred years ago, they were uh, wrapping up the peace conferences. But um, when everyone was just <clears throat> looking around, like, and we'll never have to worry about German oppression again. Mm-hmm. But uh, anyways, so yeah, that, that's really the last time the Kaiser has any sort of an impact or whatever. After that, it's just Ludendorff doing everything. Well, getting away um, from the war, I think we should wrap up the Kaiser's life. Well, well that, that, like I was going to say, that, that's basically the end of this. there can't be a whole lot left to him at this um, point. Well, no, because uh, uh, that's already 1917. You get 1918. It's the last year of the war. The war comes to an, it starts coming to an end. Germany's now allies all surrender. an interpretive dance academy. Hmm. Germany's allies all start surrendering. Um... Germany undergo then, as the German armies are being pushed back in France, um, there is a, a the German Revolution starts and it basically starts by um, the German Navy wants to Admiralty wants to send out the the high seas fleet the German Navy and basically in a suicide last hurrah to just go and attack the British na- Royal Navy. We're blockade. gonna kill them or kill ourselves or kill everybody involved. Yeah, well, so- all, Take so them down with us. Basically, naval war for funsies. Yes. Yep. For for honor's sake would be the way they would phrase it. But so for funsies. Yeah. Um. When when, when the na- when the sailors uh, hear that this is what's about to, to about to happen, they, the navy mutinies the and start like raising red revolutionary banners, whatever, in dock. 
At which point, the dock workers and the soldiers stationed in in the actual port of kind Kiel of start, start joining in with oh, them, okay. with the sailors, and then that starts spreading across the entire country. <laughs> and you got to remember, by this point in time, the Bolsheviks, the communists, have already taken power in Russia. Right. So that's the Red right. Scare about, is starting. That's the thing about a good revolution. You know, I always forget that Europe was part of the Red Scare, too. Like, I, Oh, more so. Yeah. yeah like, I always remember so. the nothing, American nothing Red Scare thing. Nothing ever happened here. Thing. McCarthy was just but a dick. Like, I forget yeah. that the Red Scare was actually a fully inflamed, legitimate, almost a war in and of itself happening in Europe. Well, because there, there's two Red Scares. There's the one after World War II, which is, like you said, that's just McCarthy being a dick um, because we're, all of a sudden we're up against the Soviets. The one after World War I, one, though, is a lot more real because they actually did some shit. They did take over Russia. They did take over Hungary for a better part of a year. They actually... They this was where their expansion in, um, started. In Munich for I'm, I'm only a couple try- of days. I'm not but trying to speak well of the USSR because I I feel that's a fool's errand. Mm -hmm. But I will say this much. Life in the USSR, probably better than life in Tsarist Russia. Uh, Depending on the area, what, what, what time in the USSR are you talking about? Because there's some Early situa- USSR there are, is what right, we're talking cause, about. Because there were definitely eras uh, under when it Stalin's was rule momentum. and early rule there, where that was not the case at all. I'm not going to say we're talking about the problems, change over time. Say overall, in terms of in terms of the legacy left behind by these eras, I'd rather live in the USSR than under the Tsar. The o- the only thing the USSR has over Tsarist Russia is the more successful military buildup, and that was done during World War II, and it was done at the cost of a lot of lives. Um, we're getting a also little way the full but in, yeah, Also the full industrialization way, 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 way. of the nation. Although the that, Russians that's, working that's on some, that that's when they, that gets, before the Soviet That's something that gets bar. buried over here, but actually gets talked about in European history. Uh, I foresee but, yeah, us having a lot of conversations about that's another these discussion. subjects. Yeah. That's a whole another let's topic Let's bring for ourselves discussion. back to Wilhelm. Anyways. Second. Yeah, so the revolution starts breaking out. The Germans, the, the German leadership are largely, you got two things that lead to the abdication. Yeah. Number one, um, the fears of the people who are trying to keep the country together that um, the, the, com- the local communists are going to see about to seize power, so they need to do something to preempt that, right? So They need to keep the commies out. Yeah, they keep the commies out. They gotta so eventually. At first, they appoint a a uh, prince whose name I forget, um, who happens one to be a politically sons. liberal guy. No, because uh, you a, said he had something like yeah, it six wasn't sons one of his, and a daughter. Yeah, it wasn't one of his sons though. It was a prince from another okay, one of the so smaller Okay, so this is German the first states. time we're seeing a government leader outside of the family. Well, no, he's he's um, it's not not that he's outside the family. The fir- the reason this guy was unique was because. He was openly politically liberal. He was he was a prince. He was a member of the nobility, but he had liberal views, like uh, Kaiser's father. Uh, yeah, yeah. And okay. This guy gets appointed chancellor as an attempt to uh, chancellor moderate. being the right hand prime minister. That, uh, gotcha. Essentially, gotcha. prime minister. Yeah. Um, right. That was the, although that was then yeah. mostly to appease, try to appease the allies to show them that they're liberalizing, although it backfired because. Well, all they saw was another. All they saw was another German prince, but yeah, um, he he's in power for a while, and then eventually, when the revolutionaries start taking control in the streets, because um, you did have workers' councils and all that pop up, although they were they didn't know it at the time, but the Bolsheviks and the the communists had far less of an influence in these groups than they did in the Russian ones. Um, they see this happening, so they decide they tell the Kaiser, "We've got to." You've got to appoint the leader of the SDP, the Social Democrats, uh, which is the lar- was the largest party in the Reichstag at the time, as chancellor, and transition over to a parliament a parliamentary democracy. Right? You've got to like give Britain. up power because this right. guy seems right. to have enough power. So with they the, sign the, the he signs an order man. that names uh, Frederick Ebert uh, as chancellor by virtue of being largest party of the Reichstag, functionally turning Germany into a parliamentary democracy. Where whoever is the leader of the government is determined by le- whoever has the votes. Who in, is the most in the popular parliament. in the populace? In, right. in, in the yeah. parliament, right? 
Um, though this only lasts for a little while because things still keep getting bad. And eventually, um, the social democratic leaders determined that the Kaiser's got to go. The Allies, are by this point in time, are also insisting the Kaiser's got to go. We will not negotiate with a government that's a He the cannot Kaiser's. be involved anymore. Yeah. The, the level of hatred th- put up towards the guy over the course of the war with the propaganda and all that was such that well, he needed to go. Well, the things that happened at the start and the whole war and everything else, yeah, no, he, he had made a lot of it. It wasn't he was, wholly undeserved. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, now, whether or not they need to get rid deserved. of the monarchy as a whole or not is questionable. I mean, any, his son was a fairly competent guy. He had other sons. Some more competent well, yeah, than others. Like that's a whole other thing. You said, um, six sons and a daughter. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's face um, it. The heir apparent's never the one that's that's uh, best suited for it. Yeah. The the, the Kaiser's eldest son, uh, oh, Crown Prince nice. Wilhelm, did it for many was um, a generally competent dude professionally. He was turned out to be a fairly good uh, army group commander. Um, kind of pretty much pretty much of a dick as a human <laughs> as a uh, human being, <laughs> but a competent leader otherwise. Um, had no real interest in leading. He could, he could have he could have taken over for his father. Although by this point in time, nobody wanted wanted him. Or the revolutionary fervor got to the point where everybody just wanted a republic. Now at that and moment, they didn't want anyone who so stank of the Kaiser. They were sick of yeah. the crown. So yeah, it wasn't right. it wasn't even Chancellor Ebert who declared a republic. It was like his one of his deputies just went out on a balcony in front of a crowd and declared Germany a republic. And it was kind of hey like, hey guys, uh, we're going to oh, be a republic now. And it, Ebert and everybody's You're kind of, happy, right? Oh, shit. He yeah. declared us a republic. Well, we were going to try and keep the monarchy, but everybody's kind of down with the republic thing now, and we can't really renege on this. So, sorry. Guess Kaiser's going to go. This. God um, damn it, Jones. Yeah, and eventually even... So, this is the plan now. Yeah. What, what do you mean, this is the plan? This is, this the, is plan the plan if, if Everybody it, likes the plan. You don't like the plan? But everybody out there likes the planet. They're the ones holding the they farm really, into They limits. really like the yeah. plan. They like the plan even more than they like their torches and their pointed objects. <laughs> they are farm implements. Mm. I, I'm pretty sure I saw a guy with a sharpened stick covered in shit. <laughs> he, he comes from the farm. That is for manure. Mm. It, it was Gunter. Anyways, he, even <laughs> he definitely made that at the ev- office this ev- morning. Eventually, <laughs> even the military guys get on un- board with the plan, and uh, Ludendorff and Hindenburg even tell him he's got he's got to go. Come on, man! Don't leave and, me. And, and in pure Kaiser Wilhelm fashion, um, at first, first he doesn't want to do it at all, and second of all, second he starts talking about you know, going out and personally standing with his armies and fighting to the last man, dying valiantly in battle, at which... Against and like, his I own really own. wish Wait. more leaders Hang actually on. made good on that promise. Uh, against Stor- the... Our movies would be so much better if there was more historical yes, precedent. Yes, ben. Was he stating he was going to stand up against his own people who were trying no. to overthrow him, or is he the like, enemy. I'm going to go out and fight the British until the I die? The French and the British. The French okay. and the British the Americans. Okay, it, he was down for... A noble pursuit, when you okay. really yeah. think about it. Well, You know what? My whole life has led up to this war, and it's the only thing I'm ever going to have. I'm going to go fight them to well, the bloody, you, bitter end. Well, when you really break it down to I guess how I can many, respect that. When you really break it down to how many wars were caused by a French or a British dude arbitrarily drawing a border because that's as far as they decided to walk that day. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure every war against them is justified from that point on. Like, it, you guys are the reason it's all so fucked up. You, you Pay the piper. Pay the piper. Yeah. Right. right. But uh, uh, yeah, even anyways. Um, so he declared that he was gonna go out, stand up, and fight. Yeah, and fighting. that lasted like less than a day before eventually he kind of tamely submitted the army. Well, yeah, because he doesn't well, want to die. Because I think uh, Lund- Ludendorff, um, one of the last things he did was well, actually no, it wasn't Ludendorff. By this point in time, Ludendorff had Ludendorff himself so basically starting in the beginning of 1918 started suffering mental breakdowns. Um, yeah, and by this point was just totally losing his shit and eventually is, had to resign. Uh, Wait, Ludendorff how old is, was uh, Hindenburg's Wilhelm and right Ludendorff at this time? Was who? Ludendorff? Ludendorff and Wilhelm. Uh, how, how old are we looking at for uh, 
Oh, uh, well, let's see. Uh, Wilhelm was born in 59, so uh, that's that 50, would put him in his 60s. He 60s. was just shy. He was 50. He was 59 uh, when just he advocated. Ludendorff was of uh, a little bit younger, I believe. What okay. 30s, 40s? Uh, Ludendorff probably would have been in his early 50s. Okay. Early 50s. I, okay. I don't quote me on Very that though. Very little. Um, Whereas like Hindenburg Might was already in, Hindenburg was already no, like for, in his sixties at the reason, start of the war. For some reason, was the Hindenburg incident during World War One? No, no, that no. was okay. after, in the thirties. Okay, that's what I thought. The, okay. the Zeppelin was named after him. Yeah, yeah. no, that yeah. that's what I thought. But uh, to my understanding, all of the Zeppelins it, that they owned were named after uh, famous German people. Mm. To, to my I understanding, that was like the gimmick of their fleet. Was that yeah. why the names were so... Because I'm sitting here doing the math in my head and going, Hindenburg had to have been dead by the time the Hindenburg... Yeah. Well, most well, people, happened. when they because hear the name Hindenburg, think of, he, he, well, think also of the because Zeppelin. If, yeah, but well, I, that's why I'm maybe, trying to make the I may be remembering this wrong or slightly warped. Brain's good at making false memories. But if I recall, there were three Zeppelins actually titled the Hindenburg, and the one that went up was the Hindenburg Three, and it's that the Hindenburgs <coughs> were their uh, uh, transatlantic flights. That I don't Possibly. know. Possibly, to my understanding, the we other two did uh, South America. Yeah. Anyways, Africa. anyways, so uh, the uh, the new head of the general uh, German army, General Groner, Gruner, I think, um, who fills who takes over after Ludendorff. L- Ludendorff basically loses it. Um, <clears throat> yeah, but by the time by the time he he resigns, he's so unpopular in Germany. He he has to uh, wear a disguise with glasses and a fake beard and, 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 and run uh, run to Sweden. Um, wow! Although then he eventually comes back and falls in with Hitler. Yeah, not not a happy ending for that guy. But anyways, um, the new the new head of the German army uh, sends messages to all the army commands and asks them if. If the army, if your armies are sent back into Germany, come back into Germany, and are ordered to put down a revolution against Stand the Kaiser, down. will they? Will oh, they fight? Okay. Will they keep fighting? Will they fight to keep the Kaiser? One of them said yes. One of them said maybe, and all the others said no. At which point the army to, pretty much turned on. And that's when they went Everybody to the. Everybody wants in on a good revolution. And that's yeah. when. And that's when they went to the Kaiser and said, "Your army, you've lost the army. You're done. You need to go." There and is he and no his son fight both here. Advocate. You will get slaughtered. Just leave, please. Yeah. Uh, Before although, we have to kill but, you in the streets yeah. and drag you. Though Wilhelm was actually one of the last ones to go. Uh, simultaneously, as all these you know uprisings are happening all over the city, they started knocking off. That's the wrong word. I don't think they actually killed any of them. Uh, started overthrowing far more easily all the lesser German princes and kings, and like Bavaria and Saxony and all that. They all went before the Kaiser did, I think. Don't quote me on that timeline, but certainly some of them did. The Bavarian King of Bavaria, I think, was the first one to go. Um, once the revolution broke out, but yeah. So uh, after once he's decided, he, he signs the uh, instrument of abdication, um, and then he and his family, um, <clears throat> not most of his kids, I don't think, but him, him, his, him and his wife. Um, so the end of World Get War One basically happened because their own people said, "Look, we're tired of this shit." Well, the Ger- the Germans had lost militarily by the time that happened. That that yeah. simply hastened the process. That, that was, but you could almost say it's like a rubber band effect. As uh, one end slipped, the other end uh, yeah. retreated just as quickly. It, more like more like um, a, a domino effect. Once. There was so much strain on the central so powers as a whole. Once one war. thing started to give, everything, all the different problems they were having, military and domestic, all just started caving in at the same time. The allies, were, like the allies, were shocked at that point. The start of the year, the Germans were kicking their butts. The spring, German spring offenses oh, yeah, almost no, that's, that's beat the, the thing, Entente. Like, they always start and then it, strong in this. It shit. flipped like it flipped like that. The, you know, you had the offensive that took out Bulgaria. Happen rapidly, and then a couple of weeks later, the Ottomans surrendered, and then a couple of days later, the Austrians surrendered. By which point in time, they didn't have a country anymore because it was falling apart politically. And then well, a few days after that, the Germans everybody kind of closed in on them, and yeah, yeah one it after was another, that makes sense. They've been holding themselves up, and it just it all Collapsed. just caved in on, on itself. But anyway, so war comes to an end. The Kaiser flees to the Netherlands. Um, where he stays, first stays in the home of a, like a, 
a Dutch aristocrat or something like that, where, oddly enough, I, I, I like this story. Um, when he, he, he arrives there and they, they ask him, you know, uh, kind of, you know, what, what, do you, what do you need? We'll, we'll, we'll get you sire or whatever. First thing he asks for is a good cup of English tea. I have Which just goes to show you forever. that you know, even after all that war, there's still... Irony. Yeah, you know, just... The way, he never stopped admiring the British to a certain extent. I mean, he, he, there was more of the hate and the love-hate relationship after the war. I but would have given him hot still there. water and made him drink it. Hmm. it. He was a lover of Earl Grey. But, uh, yeah, uh, he stays with his British aristocrat for a little while and then ends up in the uh, city called Dorn, I want to say, D-O-R-N, yeah, in the Netherlands, Dorn. on his own little private estate uh, where he'll spend the rest of his life. Um... His wife dies in 21. Well, with him in the 60s now, that couldn't have been too much longer. Uh, he he will eventually decade. die in 1941. Uh, oh, at, oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So he uh, gets to watch what happens. Yeah, uh, he dies a couple of weeks before the Germans invade the Soviet Union. Um, and again, I, I get that's to that a, in a minute. That's a weird time to exit that uh, story. We'll, we'll, get, wow. we'll get that in a second. That, that, that's <laughs> what we're going to end on. But um, before that, his wife dies in 21. Um, and he gets remarried the next year to a Dutch uh, woman. Her name was, uh, you know, Beatrice. Was it? Like, I'm not trying to pass Hermione? judgment on, you know, Hermione, I think, like someone who name? loses a spouse and finds new love. Like, good for you. But I also think if you're over 50, why the fuck are you getting married? Yeah, why are the you even bothering? What the fuck's wrong with you? A yeah, companion. His new wife, uh, Herm- Hermione, Princess of. Something or another, is, I forget. Is common um, law so bad? His new thir- wife, Hermione Granger. I mean, wait, what? Well, I was going to say, it's 30 years his junior. Um, uh, how still young how enough rich to- is he at this point? <laughs> Not really. I mean, he's got this estate, so, but so that's there's, basically so there's no the gold gift of the government. Here? Not really, no. Um, as far as I know, uh, it, 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 was a, it was a genuine marriage. Point. They were They both cared for each other. Um well, cared for each other in the sense of like, oh God, he shudders when he walks. Let me help no, him. No, it, it was a legitimate romantic marriage. They they were in love with each other. It, be, best they you can tell. Uh, although he, she, she and she um, she already had Old a daughter from a balls. She had a uh, daughter from a previous marriage, Henrietta, that lived with them. Um, yeah, she would. Uh, uh, let's say. Um, he, the thing he did most of the time when he was there, he developed a number of hobbies. Um, the biggest one was chopping wood. He chopped on like thousands and thousands with and thousands g- of trees, with, even with the gimp arm. Yeah, wood chopping. That was like his thing. He did that. He did that as a hobby during the war too. Are, are you telling me he used his mighty lumberjack fighting skills? If, if you consider chopping down a tree, fighting it, then I guess yeah. Well, I mean. It, it started with a tree and a man both standing, and it ended with only a man standing. Yeah. I, I don't know what you'd call that, Alan. Mm. I, I, I'd call it cutting down trees, but... Um, I'd call it victory. There were still trees left standing when he, when he died. He lost. Well, you see, for every one he chopped, two were planted. <laughs> Uh, which, so, which so I mean, is, is, is just good economic sense. Like, if, if you're harvesting wood f- as a renewable source, that's, that's just good common so, sense practice. So they were hydro trees? I, I, was, I was more making a comment on, like, the lack of a paper industry has actually stopped one of the few efforts to reseed. Because, I mean, they at least replanted so they'd have uh, something to chop down no, later. No, but it, uh, when he wasn't chopping down, doing, uh, chopping down trees, uh, he also... He liked to draw um, like plans for large, large uh, ornate buildings and like battleships and stuff. He got into that. What is it with Germans and drawing battleships? Okay, mm. to be fair, drawing battleships is fun. Yeah, drawing forts is okay, fun. Okay, drawing are maps cool. are fun. He also, cannons are cool. I'm not gonna uh, say that they're not. He, he also okay, bi- as D and D players and as someone who has built maps and drawn shit, drawing is fun. He also developed a uh, 
a taste for archaeology after he was uh, helped he took a trip to Corfu in Greece and helped e- excavate uh, the Temple of Artemis huh. there. Uh, mm. And he, he became a real ar- archaeology buff after that and was for the rest of his life. Neat. Yeah. Um, when uh, And that's pretty much what he did. He always hoped that the Germans would call him back or at least we put one of his sons on the throne again, restore the monarchy. Um, well, but then that which, definitely Hitler wasn't yeah. happening after well, the that, 30s. Now, now we come up to the 30s and Hitler. And we yeah, no, that definitely was not going to happen. Yeah, it, I'm sure there was definitely complex. at least some sort there, of relationship, okay, good, bad, or other. End of the rainbow, a monarchy ha- was going to be put in place, but it sure as shit was not going to be anyone in his family at the head of his. it. going to be his. Yeah, um, well... <clears throat> um, Hitler. Well, by the time Hitler comes to power, more of a dictatorship than a monarchy. Uh, look at the late stage plans. All right. Um. Anyways, when Hitler 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 comes to power, initially, the the Kaiser is down with this. Um. It, I mean, it needs well, to be said. Well, because up until that point, hadn't Hitler been kind of a for the people? Well, the the big thing with the Kaiser is he's he's a right wing. Na- Hitler is a right wing nationalist, which the Kaiser is you because monarchist. Um, and initially, he hoped he hoped that Hitler. Well, you um, missed that too. I know. He hoped that Hitler, uh, with the spurring of the right wing nationalist feeling in Germany, would lead to a upsurge in monarchism. And people wanting the monarchy back, right? That that's what because most other than the Nazis, a lot of the older right wing nationalists were still monarchists in a lot of ways. Um, I mean, they I, understood the world flowing in that structure, and they wanted to see it yeah, return to it. Right, and the guy who was president of the German Republic at this time is Hindenburg, who, even though being president of a republic, was still always a monarchist at heart. Oh yeah, no. Um, so he he, he was. Happy to see Hitler come forward initially. Um, he himself was an, 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 was generally very an, anti Semitic. Um, was actually leader of the country for it, a while. Okay, it's worth pointing out that the majority of Europe was fairly anti Semitic well, at this say, point in history. Like it's it's not a yeah, proud subject. The Kaiser's anti Semitism, like a lot of things, but but based on what I could find, like a lot of things about him fluctuated. He he went he ranged anywhere from you know, just thinking Jews had too much power and influence and liking individual Jewish individuals, like having, you know, decently close friends who were Jewish and all that, right? And just thinking, you know, a lot of the stereo, buying into the stereotypes to by, I think after the war, he, he, he got into the whole ranting and raving about blaming the Jews and international Freemasonry for Germany's yeah. loss in the war. I think he actually made a reference to... Um, Wanting to see a Russian pogrom a la carte, uh, which I think was a reference to everybody get, doing Russian-style pogroms against the Jews um, to deal with the problem and recommending gas. Because, oh. because yeah, those in one crazy can't statement. See my face. Imagine that immaculately handsome face. That doesn't But exist. mouth agape in disgust. Yeah. It. Yeah. I'm not. I, I didn't get a lot of it. I'm not sure if that was just one crazy rant on his part or if that turned more into his definitive hard opinion on the subject. Um, but like, needless to say, the dude wasn't definitely anti-Semitic uh, through his entire life, probably more so before, closer to when he died. I'm trying to um, remember, was the anti-Semitism part of the whole gypsy thing or is that, am I remember? Uh, that's a separate hatreds. but parallel thing. They, yeah, they were very much both hated in the same way. Yeah, but not part of, but, they, they, they uh, were both they hated, were but different. their own uh, yeah, okay. things were Ro- The Romany were reasons. a different issue. Uh, that's yeah. right, because, yeah, Romany. Romany, Romani, I'm not Romani. sure. I, I've always pronounced it Romani. I believe both I, pronunciations. I, I don't know which is technically correct. I believe both of them are correct, uh, whether you say right. Romani or Romani. Yeah. Um, Probably depends on the whatever accent you're using. Right. But uh, the closest to them in my gene pool would be Pikers, and as far as I know, I don't have any in yeah. my family. I think I've even heard it said Romi, 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 just Romi, not even Romani. Uh, that's but, a different thing. 
and is it? Uh, it's a slur. I'm pretty sure. Well, I'm, that's one of the more negative terms for for the same group or for somebody else. Yeah, I mean, I'm we're pretty sure it's kind of stupid. Yeah, so yeah like, if that is, I'm sorry. I didn't find our ignorance charming. Yeah. I'm sorry. It's because we grew um, up sheltered. I'm and pretty we're sure that's more sorry. of a derogatory term for the Romany. But um, okay, I, okay. I, uh, I I've heard it. I've heard that term out there in yeah, the. It, it's not a in the problem. Universe. It's so. do not blame ignorance. Blame yeah. ve- blame vengeance and purposeful and, anyways, nastiness. That's yeah. not us. Anyways, back to the Kaiser. Yeah, uh, back to we Nazis. Go back to, back the to the Kaiser, Kaiser and the Nazis. Let's, yeah, let's Kaiser and the, the Nazis. Back to the Third <laughs> Reich. <laughs> Um, Meanwhile, yeah. in Berlin, it's yeah. bad that that's lightening the mood. Um, yeah, anyway, eventually he, so. um, fairly early on though, he did uh, uh, have a falling out with. I you can't say a falling out with the Nazis because he was never like. It was he, never he a relationship a there. Member? They hated him. Ah. Hitler, and the, they bl- like a lot of well, people in Germany. They, they blamed him, him and the monarchy a, for yeah, losing the war. Why? So everything that, was that, horrible. That makes sense. Yeah, that they sense. they uh, yeah. didn't want anything to do with him beyond vague pop, prop, possible propaganda purposes, uh, which he never fully got that message. Sadly, his opinion of them, however. Yeah. Well, it went down when uh, after um, Kristallnacht. The, the night when they, the, the big thing in uh, Germany where they uh, went after all the Jewish businesses. The night uh, of the shattered glass. Glass, yeah. Uh, that, Sorry, the what night was of the long night knives. The night of shattered glass. Yep, that's crystal. Crystal knock is, yeah. That, uh, the night of the long knives, and then. I don't believe I'm there was a former, with, uh, But I'm sure we'll get into it when we hit World War yeah. II bits and pieces. Anyway, anyways, um,. He also, there was also a, the wife of a uh, former German chancellor uh, inter- in the interwar years um, that was murdered uh, by the Nazis. Um, that I, I guess he was at least vaguely on friendly terms with that with that guy. Uh, once he started that, seeing that happening, some of the more aggressive, just blatant going after people, he that really turned him off to Hitler. He started referring to them as just gangsters and thugs and the absence well, of rule. Makes you know. sense. They were a very aggressive. You know, bemoaning the absence of the rule of law. Say, almost as if uh, they, they have their origins as some sort of street gang. Yeah. Almost as if they had all roamed the streets in the same color shirt. Which uh, his one Is of his son, one of his origins? middle sons was part proudly part of. Oh. His son. Um, uh, hold on one second. Uh, Wait, one of Wilhelm's sons. Yeah, one of Wilhelm's sons. Um, hold on, which one was it? It was... Uh, my knowledge of Nazis um, and history. Oh, Auga- yeah. his well, well, the, history is this, this is proto-Nazi. This is but brown yeah, shirts. No, uh, apparently... His uh, son, it was his uh, son, uh, August name. Wilhelm, who they, who they all August called... August Wilhelm? August Wilhelm. Well, August ca- is a good n- Roman name. They called Aoi, A-U-W-I. Aoi was his, ni- his family Aww. nickname. Um, kind of Hawaiian at that point. That's like the most adorable <coughs> little kid nickname. Who, Come here, and he, he joined the SS. It, it sounds like oh, not the SS, name. pardon me, the SA. Oh. Uh, and was a member of the SA all the way through 41. Um, when he started, like a couple years prior to that, he started having fall, fallings out with some of them or like, uh, I forget exactly why, where they started to marginalize him a little, but in 41, he pissed off Goebbels, said some shitty crap about Goebbels, and then he was totally, like, given the boot. Uh, they didn't throw him in a camp or anything, but he was just like, no, we want nothing to do anymore. Though he kept oh, loving there, Hitler all no, the way to the end. There were, there were any number of people that it's like, all right, we're not removing you because we <clears> need <throat> someone in your position, but you're going way the fuck over here now. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 he was stripped if, of any power or authority. Russia, he'd be being sent to Siberia. Oh, d- the Russian front was a common place to just be like, we don't want to deal with you, and you'll probably be to dead. To the later. Russian front. Because the Russians were a major power at that point. Yeah. Well, anyways, because that's where most of the killing was happening. Yeah, no, just, again. You, know, you, you can either be here, safe behind the lines, or you can go die on the Russian front horribly in freezing cold. <clears throat> that was a pretty good incentive for a lot of people. Yeah, um, yeah but yeah, he, he was the one who really got in with it, and they lament, lamented that, like, 
his family and the Kaiser and the rest of his family were just, for the most part, were like, poor, poor Aoi, what the hell was wrong with you? Poor bastard. Um, the, whole, the whole duration of the time. I think he, um, he actually ended up getting sentenced to jail time after the war. Simply because they kept asking him to like renounce Nazism after the war, and he, I think his, his initial response was simply, say, "Like, say what now? What are, you, what are you talking about? What What do you want me to do?" Um, Does not compute. And, they, and they basically declared four? him, they declared him like permanently indoctrinated or something, and sentenced him to like two years in prison, which okay. he'd already been in, incarcerated, you know, held in custody for like two years, so he was sentenced to time served. Okay. And he got re- and got released and was just I, that's always like lived the most in ridiculous obscurity for the rest of his life. To me, no matter what the crime is, no yeah, matter what you've the fuck's been going held on. for a Time couple of years sir. already, it's like oh, yeah. uh, yeah. No, uh, his eldest son, uh, Crown Prince Wilhelm, was was a little chummy with the, the Nazis at was the beginning. Was this a Wilhelm? The- this wasn't a th- third. This is who would have been the third if they had stayed in power. His son, his eldest son. Oh, okay. So the crown the, prince. He was named the same as the previous two. He would have been the. Yeah, he would have been. He would have okay. been Wilhelm the third had they stayed on the throne. Yeah. It, royal numerals. Gotcha. Yeah, but uh, he he was like his father was kind of in with Hitler, although he was actually still living in Germany at the time, so he actually interacted with them. Although he fell out again when, once people. People he knew in an old nationalist circle started getting knocked off by the Nazis. He, he fell out with them and didn't want anything else to do with them after. Uh, most of the others, uh, I couldn't really find any. These other kids, I think, were mostly just kind of... They one of probably them served in the army. into the woodwork and kind of... Yeah. One of them served probably in the army through the rest of the war and then was just... Yeah, uh, it was just general army service. I don't think he was in the SS or anything like that. Uh... One of them in the interwar years, uh, I think it was in 29, committed suicide. Joachim, Joachim, Joachim. What happened to the daughter? Uh, The daughter um, was married to um, another German uh, noble. Given things at the time, the daughter should have been married to another noble somewhere. Yeah, I I forget who her her husband was. It was another German noble... uh, they called her Sissy to distinguish her from her grandmother and her mother. Uh, that's what uh, the who family called her. Victorious. Victorious, yeah. yeah. Um, she stayed close with her father um, for the whole thing. She was actually at, uh, at his, one of the few people at his bedside when, she, when he General died. Type. Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah. At um, bedside. Yeah, he. he, he him uh, and the, did he go of sickness or... Uh, he had an em- like an embolism or something, or? I think, is what he ultimately okay. died of. Um, but, no, before that, as the Germ- as the, the Nazis were taking power in Germany uh, and taking over stuff, he kept ma- he made appeals, and then his wife made appeals, his second wife, to the Nazis and all that, like advocating the return to the monarchy, which the, Germ- the Nazis just ignored. Well, because they were very much against the monarchy. Yeah. Uh, he would. I mean, sent, like he, he tried to suck up to him a little bit, send him congratulations on like their various conquests and that. And you guys did good <coughs> invading France. I mean, in thumbs up. I, be- I believe there's there's a quote where like um, after they beat France, he, the the Kaiser makes a question like uh, like a reference to like doing it in his name and doing it with his the Kaiser's army. To which like when Hitler sees this, he's just like. What the hell is this crap? Oh yeah, you guys, guys did look at what this! I look at this nut, look at this nut job! You know, just totally out of touch with reality. Um, Which, from what I understand about the Kaiser, wasn't completely wrong. <laughs> yeah. Very but, out uh, of touch with reality. Yeah, well, yeah, with the whole idea of just wanting the you know, thing of the Germans would invite him or his son, one of his sons, back to be monarch. Um, he, he, like I said, he d- he does die uh, in of like uh, an, a brain embolism or something like that uh, in and 1941. You said that was 41. In 41, yeah. uh, a couple of weeks before the invasion of the Soviet Union, which would have made it uh, probably early June. I don't think I wrote, did I write down the date. I think I wrote down the date. Let me see. On a piece of paper, uh, June 4th. Okay. Okay. Yeah, June 4th, 1941. Uh, in, in the, his home in the Netherlands, uh, the, the so a Soviets were invaded. So a couple weeks ago and a few hundred years, or a yeah. hundred and some. Um, 
Yeah. No, uh, not quite a hundred. When he, when he died, uh, he he made um, a request years. explicitly that he did not want to be returned to Germany, living or dead, until the monarchy had been restored, which they'd held to. He is still buried in the Netherlands. Okay. Um, he also requested that no, at his funeral, because by this point in time, the Netherlands are under Nazi control. Right. Um, the, the Germans actually put like a military guard outside his place, which when Hitler found out about it, was furious at. He didn't think he deserved the the honor of the respect. <laughs> oh, and I'm almost, sure came very close to firing the general who had ordered it, ordered ordered the guard. Um, but when he respect died, for a you know that leader. sounds like coked out Hitler. Mm. Was Hitler? Oh yeah, what? no, no. One of his doctors was trying to kill him with amphetamines. I, I didn't think cocaine was a oh, thing dude, in no. Europe during. Oh, dude, no. The Nazis really? made cocaine pills and distributed them to their soldiers. No, no, no. No, the Nazis loved giving their soldiers drugs. They fucking Ooh. loved it. So much <laughs> amphetamine, dude. Oh, no, but wow. Okay. Well, uh, another Nazis conversation run for on another meth. time. If you, if you ever look at a Nazi biker and go, like, the real Nazis would never do it. No, 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 no. This is the logical fucking evolution of that much amphetamine. Yeah. It is that the Nazi super soldier program will just give them lots of amphetamines. That was one of them. Hmm. No. Another topic, another time. Yeah. The other big request he put in as well. Excuse me was that uh, at his funeral, no Nazi paraphernalia or swastikas or anything be anywhere near it. That I think that's reasonable. Order. That didn't happen. That no. was ignored. Hitler made, ignored that because they used his funeral for propaganda purposes. Well, yeah. Even in yeah, the footage well, we have today, you can, see, you can see there's swastika flag and all of that all over it. Of course he did. But, you know, so I think that was kind a of a shitty way to go out for though. him. But... Being that he didn't agree with that political system yeah. to uh, well, the, you know the Nazis that, don't care no, about I that. Don't want that. Well, they did the yeah, same thing to Rommel. I am but. choosing to look at this outside of the whole Nazi stigmatism thing. Is just one leader with a politi- with political differences and systems and going. I think that's completely reasonable for a political leader who does not believe in the current political system to decide that, no, I don't want that current political system to be outwardly present at my funeral. I didn't agree with it. I don't like it. Well, although you said he was kind of on and off as to his support. Early, early on, but it was, it was less a matter of the ideology, even the anti-Semitic thing, even though he was anti-Semitic. It was more a matter of a revival of German nationalism and, you know, the idea of a because he was a mon- he's a monarch yeah, he's a monarchist he believes in one person ruling right. the country while everybody has very little well, no say he believes in the monarchy ruling the country yeah. because thought, let's face it Hitler did rule the country he, he thought Hitler and the Nazis were going to bring back the monarchy which is why he was happy about it at first yeah uh, but and instead then it was, he kind once, of was attempting to institute a new monarchy that well, in, didn't a new, include. No. The Nazis him. were not monarchists. They didn't like the idea of no, hereditary monarchy. they were dictators. They didn't like the Hohenzollerns in particular. Yeah. For Like I said, they blamed them as much as the, the Jews or the Social Democrats for right. the, end, for the uh, Germany losing in the but war. But when you get past the definitions, Hitler was essentially a new kind of king. Yeah, well, that's why we came up with a word for, with, for that. Yeah. yeah. I can't talk. A word, new word for that. It's called fascism. Uh, um, well, that doesn't originate oh. with Hitler, and that's, again, well, yeah. another conversation because yeah. I'm trying to prevent Nick from my, going My point is here. simply he fits into that category, not monarchy. Not monarchy. Right, right. They're two different ideologies, but this is simply the point I was making. But He was establishing himself as a new, all-powerful ruler. The, pa- the fascists the always refer to themselves as the third way. Yeah. Uh, the difference is themselves between himself as West the new and the fundamental thief, but ruler yeah. and overlord anyways, of the area. Yeah, but anyways, yeah. So once yeah. once Wilhelm realized this guy isn't on yeah, board isn't with me, yeah, isn't gonna come with us. No, and and okay, once he, the once they started split. killing people and uh, the whole you know, SS and everything else. Yeah, he didn't. He wasn't a fan yeah. of any of that. So although I mean, he was glad to see Germany like kick ass. Well, he was right, happy when Germany took country. over Poland and France it, and all that. He but, always loved his country and wanted to see his country Well, because he was a nationalist. He was an imperialist yeah, nationalist. Right. He was all like, Deutschland, fuck yeah, saving the world and the motherfucking day, yeah. 
Deutschland! Fuch ja! Ah, Freiken ja! Deutschland! Freiken ja! Um, but yeah. What would Team Germany World Police look like? I would watch that. I oh, would probably too. overly the muscle because they'd part. have two yeah. guys, Hans and uh God Gunter's my always other stereotypical German name. I'm trying to remember the two from Dragon Ball Z in hell. Hans and Oh, Hans and Franz. Hans and Franz. Yes. Which uh. I believe is a <laughs> spoof on an old SNL bit. I believe so. It, it was their bit I, about I think that's a Dean Martin bit. It, uh, it, it's a bit about um, the the German weightlifters. Yeah, things. no, I'm yeah. pretty sure it's a Dean Martin bit, and I forget I don't who we did it. Remember that, with. but anyways. Yeah, but uh, so yeah, that, and obviously he's dead now. That's the end of his life. Uh, he, like I said, he stayed buried in the Netherlands on that estate. Um, the the family actually won a court case. Uh, I believe in the interwar years, uh, they were able to get a lot of their property from at least one of their castles back, which they took to the Netherlands with them. Okay. The the Wait, Holland uh, family. They took their the castle, castle to the no, Netherlands. No, the property from their like their oh, the furniture okay, okay. and the gar- all that I'm stuff. I'm sorry, uh, Nick I was and I both having heard the so same much thing. more fun with the <laughs> idea of they hired an army of masons and brick by brick. Moved oh no, this no. Bitch. See, yeah. I was thinking uh, Greenfield Village style. No, no, I was thinking Robin Hood men in tights. They just loaded it up on a semi and moved it. Lots of oxen. But yeah, um. <clears throat> the uh, the family still uh, exists today. I mean, they they had enough kids. Well, uh, um, they, yeah, they fr- have propagated through the years. I, I believe the current uh, head of the family is a is another Frederick, uh, young guy. He just uh, his father his father just died a couple of years ago, uh, and he took over uh, head, as head of the family. What are his um, thoughts on reinstating the monarchy? He's like most of them, he's vaguely nebulous about it. Where it's kind of like, I know nobody <laughs> wants to do this, but I'm not going to say I don't uh, want it in case they ever change their mind. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm sure like, he's hey, quite guys, willing to let's stay just neutral leave on all it. All the options on the table. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. All in all, I gotta say, I mean, his life is fascinating. The the oh yeah no, do, do way he led life. his life yeah. is truly fascinating and. I'm not going to say good, bad, or otherwise, but I will say that after this whole discussion, I think I... Number one, I feel bad for the guy. He was put into a lot of situations that he didn't have a lot of options. Yeah, there, there was a he lot was of, kind of forced into a lot of the things you know, he okay. had to do. He had a lot okay, of circumstances given, given that were that, beyond his control. Like, ignoring the very bitter end, Honestly, I find the story oddly optimistic. It's it's a kid who got shit on, born to an incredible disadvantage in a he world definitely where, he would, rose. where he would be taken advantage of given those conditions. It, and he, he overcame it. I mean, shit went sideways. Well, but in a poetic verse, he no, definitely it, it rose to, be, to his position. Less than he overcame it, at, like overcoming adversity, and more a matter of he over. Powered it by flailing around wildly, causing that's chaos. A, that's a type of overcoming adversity. And, and, uh, in, in, I, I, feel that's, causing... I feel that's the story of America, Alan. I'd we say... just flail aimlessly into the future, and occasionally someone gets smacked I, down by I, our limbs. What I will say is um, he, he's definitely had a bit of a reputation um, bump up a little bit in more recent years. I mean, you know, immediately after the war, he was blamed. He and Germany were blamed entirely oh, for the yeah. war. They actually, the Allies actually tried to get the Dutch to extradite him. They wanted to uh, put him on trial, but the Dutch refused to oh, do I it. I believe it. Well, everybody always wants a scapegoat. They, you want yeah. someone that it's you can easy just tie to it blame. up nice and neat on. Uh, it uh, also you know helps that the public remi- come to terms with what's going um, on. If you have the, one guy who is claimed as the bad guy... That person can be, like you say, yeah, a scapegoat, scapegoat, but it makes the public a whole lot better at recovering from the damage. Uh, there are reasons scapegoats exist. Yeah, but it reminds me, um, actually, after the end of the Second World War, um, his his uh, eldest son, the Crown Prince, Crown Prince Wilhelm, was actually 
detained briefly on char- on uh, war crimes charges from the first war. <laughs> um, yeah, and they, um, uh, although they eventually got re- he was eventually released, I think, but involved at least a little bit. Well, his, his eldest son uh, was a army and then army group commander uh, right. in the war. Um, I don't know of anything he specifically did um, as far as like any atrocities or anything like that. Um, though Lord knows they those those existed. I don't know if he was involved in any of those. So because he was down on that part of the front. There are no innocents in war. That's yeah. that's a misnomer that people need to abandon. Well, well, most of, most yeah, of the it doesn't German matter what side you come out yeah. on. Everybody did some pretty horrible shit. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but I mean, like so he, his reputation has received a little bit of a bump simply as a matter of a, a guy who is at, at times well intentioned, other times just kind of crazy and you know made some really bad decisions. Weak mind, weak weak minded. Didn't have a weakness. As, as, to stand as up a to world people. leader, C, C minus? As a world leader, F. Definitely. <laughs> if you're talking about actual effect and actual ab- ability to run uh, the country, F. He should uh, never yeah, have been running a country. He pretty much gave over his country to all if of he had, If he had been king and, or emperor advisors. in a constitutional monarchy like Britain, he'd have been that kind of weird, eccentric uncle figure that just is always in the news, who's the guy who gives the, the drunk speech at the wedding reception kind of a thing. Trump. And that everybody just was filled the tabloids and everybody was just kind of laughing at, you know. But the dude had a, a, was actually in charge of the mo- one of the most powerful nations on the planet, you know, in a time of extreme tension. And, you know, he didn't cause he it himself, but again. led to the conditions in a lot of ways to a situation that killed tens of millions of people and did a lot of freaking damage. And if you include the Second World War in, you know, the, is the collateral damage of the first, that's even more so. That's, that's what, like 70, 80 million people all total. Well, when you put it that way. Yeah. But he, the boy, like you said, he didn't want that. That wasn't something he set out to do. It wasn't part of his it was, personal belief. That this is something that should be done. It was less of anything he like specifically set out to do. It was more of his inability to properly manage things. I think that's a lot of world history when you really start Uh, breaking it down. Really, are the it's a series of small decisions that don't get handled well that add up later. Yeah, he 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 made decisions that led to the war and led to a lot of things that happened, but there were also other decisions that if they had been made differently would have prevented it as well. He was not the begin-all, end-all of the problem. There were other people in his own country and in others who I feel definitely bear far more responsibility, uh, especially if we're talking about the actual outbreak of the war, but yeah. Definitely something to think about and uh, something that I mean... Interesting guy, though. Interesting yeah. guy, yeah, as you said. Very overall, interesting, interesting guy person. And worthy of note. Definitely a good delve into somebody who I had only ever thought of as, yeah, no, he was supposedly the villain of you, you, World you, you, War One. You I. thought of him? Uh, uh, only you, you, you mildly. But in the case of, oh, yeah, no, World War One, the Germans were the bad guys, right? Because yeah. that yeah. was my knowledge. If we're going to take anything out of this man's life, I, I think the one thing you can take from it is simply a, it being a strong piece of evidence as to why giving actual power to hereditary monarchies is a bad thing. Why picking your leader because just because they were the child of the other guy does, is never a good is never a good idea is never a guaranteed choosing a leader based on just because he's your kid. Uh, choo- yeah. Choosing a leader, uh, genetic based leadership is not a thing. Yeah, it, it yeah. does not pass on the traits you're hoping it will. Be- because well, for every Frederick the Great, you get a Kaiser Wilhelm II. It's like for every Tsar Alexander, you get a Tsar Nicholas, or Peter yeah. the Great. I should say Tsar Alexander is a bad example, but well, point we're, made. We're, we're rambling. It's time for us to go. Yeah, thanks for listening. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.
next time on Informed and Confused. Jackie Chan only has a career because he got knocked out by Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee felt bad about it. Do you really think anybody out there gets a shit about Steven Seagal? I saw a fucking ghost. Ooh.